You people are relentless. All I've heard for the last week is Napoleon in Egypt from Epic History TV. When are you going to do Napoleon in Egypt from Epic History TV? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's here. I'm doing it. All right. Napoleon in Egypt, the Battle of the Pyramids from Epic History TV. There's probably nobody who does it better when it comes to presenting the story of the Napoleonic Wars than Epic History TV. We've gone through most of their uh, videos on this topic. I know I haven't done Napoleon's Marshals yet. You ask for that all the time, too. It will happen. I just don't want to get Napoleon fatigue, you know. Uh, and we have actually taken a look at the story of Napoleon in Egypt recently from uh, Extra History. So if you haven't already seen that series, I'll put a link up at the end so you can check that out. But the link is in the description down uh, at the bottom so you can check this out, the original content without my commentary. And I constantly get people commenting to me telling me, oh, I hear you have a gaming channel. Or if, uh, if you ever start a gaming channel, guys... Link in this links in the description of every single video to my other channels. Check them out if you haven't already. Uh, I've been uploading some new content to VTH Extra lately. There are some new videos up on gaming as well. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. Before I do, though, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to Owen uh, in Seattle, Washington, who is an executive producer level patron, as well as Rebecca in Minot, South Dakota. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, Rebecca, Minot, North Dakota. Got to get that right. I know the Dakotas are proud. Thank you for your support as a producer level patron. Let's go ahead and dive in. May 1798. A massive French invasion force sails across the Mediterranean. 55,000 men aboard more than 300 ships, escorted by 13 ships of the line. Aboard the most powerful of these, the 120-gun Lorient, sails General Napoleon Bonaparte. France's celebrated hero of the war in Italy has received new orders from his government. He is to lead an expeditionary force east to Egypt, the wealthiest province of the Ottoman Empire. So a couple of things are happening here. Napoleon had been at one point appointed to an army that was called the Army of England, I think. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. With the idea of forming an invasion force to land uh, on the southern coast of England and knock them out of the war. Because remember, the Napoleonic Wars don't keep going throughout the first couple of decades of the 19th century without the backing of the British military, the British Navy, and British money. So the big thorn in the side of the French continues to be the British. So they're going to try and do something about it, but they're not able to make that happen because of the British Navy. Same reason so many others have failed to defeat the British. So if you can't get at them directly, you've got to find some other way to get at them. So you go after them economically because they're funding these wars and they're going to continue. This is 1797, 1798, so this is early yet. Uh, but you've got to knock British money out of these continental wars. So how do you do that? You go off after their trade. And to all educated Europeans, an ancient land of mystery and wonder. After six years of war in Europe, the French Republic faces one last remaining enemy, Great Britain. The conquest of Egypt will strike a powerful blow against the British, disrupting their trade in the Eastern Mediterranean and threatening their connections to India and the East. So just a point of clarification here because there's a lot of mixing of names at times, Great Britain, United Kingdom, England, those sorts of things. The simplest way to put it in this case is that Great Britain is this island. It becomes the United Kingdom about a decade after this when they add Ireland. So it becomes the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, uh, all under one. And it's uh, 
become Great Britain because about 200 years before this, Scotland and England came under a union of crowns. The King of Scotland was also the King of England. They passed an act of union that made that official, uh, linked the two governments about 80, 90 years before this. Uh, and then, in, of course, in the 20th century, Ireland and Northern Ireland will split. So now it's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, whereas Ireland is a republic that's separate and not part of the monarchy. Uh, but at this point, they are still Great Britain and will be for about another decade. These profitable trade networks help fuel the British war effort. What's more, it will extend France's revolutionary, civilizing mission to the people of Egypt, liberating them from superstition and feudalism. France's corrupt and avaricious government, the Directory, sees two further benefits from the campaign. The opportunity to acquire tremendous riches, and to get the alarmingly popular and ambitious General Bonaparte far away from Paris. And it's never a good sign when your government leaders who have only come to power because, because of overthrowing the previous government, which they saw as corrupt and tyrannical, when you come in and you become the same corrupt and tyrannical, well, I don't know if they were tyrannical, but certainly corrupt and only in it for themselves, uh, and your, your goal is not to benefit your people, that can only harm you in the long run. And this is going to be the beginning of the end of the directory, and it's going to be this directory that is overthrown in the coup when Napoleon comes back from Egypt and uh, is brought on board as kind of the military muscle for a, a coup to overthrow the directory because the directory was falling apart anyway. They were losing control. Uh, and, and it was an attempt to control what would come next because everybody knew something was coming next. It was just a matter of what that was going to be. And Napoleon takes advantage of that. Where plots and coups are never far from anyone's mind. Napoleon is thrilled by the expedition, which he has done much to promote and organize himself. It is a chance to win fresh glory and to walk in the footsteps of his heroes. Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. Yep. Don't underestimate that part. See, uh, Napoleon was a prolific writer, and he wrote all the time about how much he looked up to those two guys in particular. Other, others as well. He talked about Frederick the Great and other people, but Alexander and Caesar are the two all the time. And what do they both have in common? fighting in the Middle East. They both did that. And so this is an opportunity, like he said, to walk in their footsteps. Also remember that much of what we know in modern times about Egyptian history wasn't known yet. Egypt is very much still a mystery. And so there is that potential for historic and scientific discovery. And, and Napoleon was always really interested in that. This is not a military-only minded kind of guy. He's very interested in culture and writing and art and history and science, all of that stuff. Like Alexander, Napoleon even has fanciful notions of marching yep. on to India to attack the British there. Europe is a molehill. He had told his secretary, Bourrienne, we must set off for the Orient. That is where all the greatest glory has been achieved. But the Mediterranean is dangerous water for the French. While the Republic's armies have won great victories on land, Britain has cemented its status as the dominant naval power of the age. With decisive victories over French allies, the Spanish at Cape St. Vincent, and the Dutch at Camperdown. Rear Admiral Sir Horatio Nelson and his squadron of 14 ships of the line now prowl the Mediterranean. Nelson knows a large French fleet has just left Toulon, but does not know its destination, which remains a closely guarded secret. This is one of those times in history, and we talk about this from time to time, about how things could have gone differently. And this could be a diverging point in history if you're talking about alternate history. What if Nelson stumbles on the French fleet? What if he stumbles on this massive transport uh, force that's taking this 50,000-man army? 
What if he sinks the ship Napoleon's on and kills Napoleon? How different does the world look today? Undetected, the French expedition sails south along the Italian coast. On the 9th of June, it arrives off Malta. The island is ruled by the Knights of St John, a religious military order dating back to the Crusades. But the French have decided that they want it for a naval base, and a thorn in the side of the British. In 1565, the Knights had famously held out against a vast Ottoman army for three months. Wow. Now, despised by the locals, divided amongst themselves, the Knights surrender to Napoleon in just two days. So that makes you wonder, what changed in 200 years? Did the Knights of St. John weaken that much? Were they more sympathetic to Napoleon's cause and maybe antithetic toward the British? Um, a lot of questions about why that happened so easily at that point. During his six days in Malta, Napoleon overhauls its archaic government, establishes schools, abolishes slavery, and requisitions money and supplies. This is what Napoleon does. He doesn't just conquer a place, he transforms it. He transforms the laws, the government. That's always been a big part of who he is, and that, that should not be underestimated. This is not about military conquest. In fact, at this part, at this point, Napoleon's really, this is more offense for the sake of defense. You know, if the British had dropped out of the war and said, we're done interfering on the continent of Europe, none of this probably is necessary. Then he sails for Egypt, leaving General Vaubois and a 5,000 strong garrison to hold the island. But where is the Royal Navy? Back in May, Nelson's squadron had been dispersed by gales. He has now regrouped, correctly guessed Napoleon's destination, and is racing to intercept. If he can catch the French, British seamanship and gunnery all but guarantee the destruction of Napoleon's fleet. Then, a lucky break for the French. On the night of the 22nd, Nelson's squadron passes within a few miles of the French fleet. But thanks to heavy fog and darkness, neither side is even aware of the other's presence. How many times in history has the weather changed everything? George Washington's army was saved by a timely fog uh, on Long Island in 1776. The British uh, or the English uh, fleet is able to defeat the Spanish Armada in part because of the weather. The Japanese have been saved by the weather a number of times. Interesting. The British squadron sails on to Alexandria, where they find no sign of the French. An exasperated Nelson waits 24 hours before heading north to continue his search. Just hours later, the first of Napoleon's wow. ships arrive off Alexandria. Timing is everything. Napoleon was always fantastic at motivating his men. They called him the little corporal, not as a derogatory comment, but as a, it, it was a way of saying that they identified him as being one of them. They always felt connected to him. That's one of the reasons why they fought for him as hard as they did for as long as they did, and sometimes with massive attrition because they believed in him, because he made them believe in themselves. He was fantastic at this sort of thing. Napoleon, aware that British warships are in the area, wants to disembark as quickly as possible. 5,000 French infantry go ashore at night, storm Alexandria the next morning, and quickly overpower its garrison. The rest of the French army lands safely. Napoleon has brought 38,000 troops to Egypt, mostly veterans of the Army of Italy. 
The five infantry divisions are commanded by Generals Bon, Dessay, Kleber, Menou, and Reniere. The single cavalry division is led by the towering Dumas. figure of Thomas Alexandre Dumas. He is France's first black general, born in what's now Haiti, to a French aristocrat and enslaved African woman. He has already won fame for his actions in Italy, where the Austrians had nicknamed him the Black Devil. That's awesome. There are more familiar faces from Italy. And uh, as many people know, he is the father of Alexandre Dumas, who wrote The Three Musketeers, Man in the Iron Mask, things like that. Uh, I think, didn't he also write The uh, Count of Monte Cristo? Fantastic story, by the way. Um, yeah, so uh, Black General, and you'll see him in the Napoleon movie. He is portrayed, even though, like most of Napoleon's generals, he doesn't really get mentioned much in that m movie. Napoleon's chief of staff, the indefatigable General Berthier. And brigade commanders, Generals Murat, Lannes, and Marmont. Who will become marshals later. The army is also accompanied by 167 scientists, scholars, artists, and assorted experts. Even a hot air balloonist. Collectively, they are known as the savants. And of this is definitely one of the most important aspects of this whole thing. Forget the military achievements. That all really didn't change much in the end. But the scientific and the archaeological discoveries massive implications. have come to study Egypt's historical and natural wonders. But they and Napoleon find Alexandria a bitter disappointment. The fabled city of antiquity, founded by Alexander himself, has been reduced by centuries of earthquakes and neglect to a ramshackle town of 6,000 inhabitants. Egypt is nominally ruled by the Ottoman Empire. In reality, power lies with local Mamluk warlords. Two in particular, Murad Bey and Ibrahim Bey. Mamluks were originally slave soldiers who once served the Islamic Caliphate. Superb horsemen and fearless warriors, they now rule Egypt with an iron fist, expropriating its wealth and leaving its peasants in poverty. To most Egyptians, they are despised foreign overlords, hmm. a situation that Napoleon hopes to exploit with clever propaganda. Yeah, he sets up printing presses. He starts doing everything he can to ingratiate himself to the locals. Napoleon was always concerned about that sort of thing. And so he starts learning all he can about Islam, even flirts with the idea of converting to Islam. And he would do this multiple times. When he was in Italy, he would focus very heavily on Catholicism. Uh, he recognized the importance of identifying with the locals, the whole hearts and minds sort of thing. That's what he's after here. To the people of Egypt, he proclaims, I am come to restore your rights and punish usurpers. I reverence God, his prophet, and the Quran. Meanwhile, Murad and Ibrahim summon Mamluk warlords to the Al-Azhar Mosque in Cairo. Here, they agree to gather an army to crush the invaders. Napoleon believes his best option is to strike quickly. Less than a day after his troops finish landing, he begins his advance on Cairo. But he misjudges the blistering climate and the barren, windswept landscape. He forces the pace even after his men run out of water and are consumed by thirst. Mm. Hundreds collapse and die. A few little foreshadowing of what's going to happen in Russia, only the opposite weather extreme. Instead of really cold, you've got really hot here. You kill themselves to escape the suffering. Bedouin horsemen circle the French like vultures. Stragglers that fall into their hands are robbed tortured and killed. Even old comrades like Lan and Murat are involved in heated conversations about Napoleon's decision-making. Mm. The army takes four days to cover the 45 miles to Damanhur. 
where mercifully they are able to rest, drink and trade for food. It's not a moment too soon. News arrives that a large force of Mamluks under Murad Bey is approaching from the southeast. The French advance to meet them at Shubrahit, on the banks of the Nile. As 4,000 Mamluk horsemen come into view, the French marvel at their brightly coloured outfits, embellished with gold and jewels, and their many ornate weapons, including pistols, swords, daggers and lances. Murad boasts that he will sever Frenchmen's heads like slicing watermelons in a field. So this is going to be interesting because you have two very different styles of fighting coming face to face. And Napoleon's never faced an army like this. This army has never faced a guy like Napoleon before. So it's going to be a clash of cultures, a clash of very different ideas on how to fight. But for all their bravado and panache, the Mamluks have neither the discipline nor tactics to face a trained modern army. When Napoleon forms his troops into giant squares, the Mamluk cavalry can only circle impotently. Unha They've probably never seen this before, and when you're cavalry, you're riding horses which have brains of their own, and which aren't robots that just do exactly what you tell them to do. And when they come up against these squares, they're going to do what horses do, which is avoid charging into the square. You don't want to get stabbed by the guys with the bayonets sticking out. And, and there's nothing they can do about it. Able to break through the walls of French bayonets. Scores are shot from the saddle. After two hours, the Mamluks call off their attack and retreat. They have suffered around a thousand casualties. The French have scarcely lost a man. The victory is a much-needed morale boost for Napoleon's men after the hardships of the desert. The Mamluks fall back to Mbaba, a small town on the banks of the Nile, across the river from Cairo. Here, within sight of Egypt's fabled pyramids nine miles to the south, they will face the invader with their full force. Hmm. Yeah, it's easy when you're when you're in the site of one of the most impressive structures ever constructed by man, it's pretty easy to find ways to inspire your men to victory. They're 9 miles away, but a structure that massive in a flat plain 9 miles away would have been clearly visible. Forty centuries of history are looking down on you. <laughs> on the sweltering afternoon of the 21st of July, Napoleon's forces approach Mbeba. He has 25,000 men, organized into five giant divisional squares, with cavalry and baggage inside, and cannon at every corner. Hmm. Murad, with characteristic boldness, has crossed to the west bank of the Nile, leaving Ibrahim behind. Their forces total many thousands, but sources disagree wildly on just how many. His elite Mamluk cavalry, 6,000 strong, are deployed between the small village of Bictil and the well-fortified town of Mbeba. So this whole cavalry force numbers roughly what one of these squares is. And now Napoleon's already encountered them once. So I, I have to feel like him and his men, they have a lot more confidence because they've already taken them on once. This time they're prepared. This time they're ready. This time they're going in with a chance to really win a great victory. Which is garrisoned by a mix of Ottoman infantry and peasant militia. Napoleon's plan is simple, to drive through the enemy centre and crush their right flank against the river. 
At 3.30pm, Desai and Reniers' divisions begin their advance. The fact that he's just going to go straight forward, he's already done the preparation as far as formations go, that he's just going straight forward shows how little regard he has for the Mamluks in this case. He just figures we can just plow right through them. But as they move across the broken ground, their formation becomes disordered. That's a problem. Murad spots his chance and unleashes his cavalry. The Mamluks thunder forward at lightning speed. Dissay and Brenier react just in time and close ranks. The French hold their fire until the last moment, then unleash a devastating volley. Horses and riders are sent tumbling. The survivors have no way to get to grips with the enemy, who continue pouring deadly fire into their midst. Mm. The Mamluks wheel back to regroup, but more charges meet the same result. See, how do you deal with these anti-cavalry squares? Well, you deal with it with infantry and artillery, which you don't have. An all-cavalry force in this case has no chance against a disciplined uh, infantry square in this situation. None at all. Many Mamluks simply give up and flee the field. Napoleon orders the divisions of Bon and Vial to move forward. Once more, the Mamluk cavalry charge. Once more, the wave of horsemen shatters on French musketry and bayonets. With the enemy cavalry broken, Bon and Vival's men pour into Mbeba. It is a slaughter. Mm. Those who are not killed flee into the Nile, where hundreds drown. Murad Bey escapes with the remnants of his cavalry to Giza, from where he will withdraw to southern Egypt. Ibrahim Bey watches the calamity unfold across the river, then withdraws I'm with out. his men back to yep. Cairo. He wisely stayed on that side. It is a crushing, one-sided victory that takes just two hours. But the problem is for Napoleon is not about winning victories. It's easy for him to win victories on the battlefield. The problem for him is what happens in between the victories. The Mamluks suffer more than 5,000 casualties, with heavy losses among their elite cavalry and leadership. French losses Brutal. are less than 300. That's... Napoleon, with his usual flair for PR, decides this great victory will be known as the Battle of the Pyramids, just in sight to the south. On the 24th of July, Napoleon enters Cairo. Parts of the city are abandoned and in ashes after being torched by the Mamluks in their frantic withdrawal. Na Another little uh, foreshadowing of Moscow there. Napoleon observes it would be difficult to find a richer land and a more wretched, ignorant and brutish people. Nonetheless, Cairo is the heart of Egypt a city of 600,000 inhabitants, and is in French hands. 600,000, even now, is a pretty good-sized city. Uh, back then, that is huge. I mean, let's, let's compare that to some things here. So here's the population of Paris from 1600. Um, actually, it goes back to 1365. In 1796, well, heck, in 1801, Paris has 546,000 people. Cairo's bigger than Paris. That gives you a little bit of perspective on the size of the city that Napoleon's got to try and occupy and manage with an army of 30,000 or so. And he's got to deal with armies that are descending on him. And it's not just Cairo. There's a lot of other territory that's got to be covered as well. Mamluks scattered and on the run Napoleon's dream of Eastern conquest seems about to be realized. Hmm. Just eight days later, the dream is shattered. Hmm. 
At sea, Nelson and the British Mediterranean Squadron have not given up their hunt for the French fleet. Finally, on the afternoon of the 1st of August, Nelson finds the French sheltering in Aboukir Bay. With 14 ships of the line against 13, he decides to attack that evening. The British win a complete and stunning victory. Just as Napoleon, if you give Napoleon even odds, he's pretty much always going to win on the battlefield. Same thing with the British, especially guys like Nelson. You give them fairly even odds uh, in a sea battle, and they're going to win pretty much every time. The, the French only chance in this situation would have been ha to have a massive numbers advantage because they didn't have the tactical knowledge to be able to defeat Nelson. The giant French flagship Lorient is destroyed in a massive explosion. By the time it's over, the British have destroyed or captured 11 French ships of the line and taken more than 3,000 prisoners. With no fleet, Napoleon is stranded in Egypt. What's more, most of his army's cash has gone down with Lorient. How are you going to pay? But Napoleon does not despair. How are you going to pay not only your army, but how are you going to pay for what you need from the civilian populace? exchange for things. You want their goodwill, you're going to need to buy things from them. You can't just take it. So this really sets him off on the wrong foot. If anything, he is invigorated by the crisis. His options are now simple. He and his army must support themselves in this foreign land or perish. Burn the ships. While General Desay is sent south in pursuit of Murad Bey, Napoleon sets about reforming the administration of Egypt. Like I said, what's the first thing he does when he conquers a land? He reforms it. Tries to make it easier to be able to control the populace by reforming their laws, their government, their structures, everything. The old feudal system is abolished. A postal service and hospitals are set up. And a new tax system introduced. Napoleon establishes the Institute of Egypt for scientific and scholarly research. He shows great interest in and respect for Islam, yeah. funding the construction of mosques and encouraging the observance of religious festivals. Such engagement later leads to rumours that Napoleon actually converted to Islam. But it is merely a tactic to curry local favor. Napoleon always understood the importance of using religion as a way of controlling the populace. It's why when he comes to power in France, he negotiates with the Pope for the restoration of the Catholic Church in France. I remember the French Revolution had been also a revolution against uh, the influence and power of religion, uh, in particular Catholicism in France. Uh, so he restores some of that it's hard to say exactly what Napoleon believed. He's probably a deist, probably believes in, in God, but not a God that's actively involved in the affairs of man. Uh, it's hard to say, though, because he was so adept at embracing whatever religion was going to help him as a means to an end. Napoleon also grapples with news that his wife, Josephine, has resumed her affair with an ex-lover. Yep. It is, he's told, common knowledge amongst Paris society. He consoles himself with affairs of his own, including one with an officer's wife. All the while, French efforts to win over the local population are failing. Most Egyptians see only foreign occupiers and infidels. Yep. The situation is already at boiling point. Minor revolts break out across the Nile Delta, which are brutally suppressed by the French. And this is where you have escalation, right? You're trying to control the populace, they rebel, you put it down brutally, that just makes the populace want to rebel even more, which you have to put down even more brutally, and it just ramps up the tension more and more. 
Then in September, from Constantinople, Sultan Selim III declares a holy war against the French. Now, the situation in Egypt is about to explode. Cairo, the 21st of October, 1798. General Dupuy, Cairo's military governor, is called out to break up a disturbance. He finds the locals erecting barricades, is set upon and killed. Mm. Soon the whole city is up in arms. You got 20, 25,000 men and you got a 600,000 person city in rebellion and you are a thousand miles or more from help. The French fight back with ruthless discipline and crush the revolt. Some 300 French soldiers are killed, alongside several thousand Egyptians. Napoleon ostentatiously pardons the ringleaders, while quietly telling Berthier that every rioter caught with a weapon is to be beheaded and thrown into the Nile. The French have bloodily reasserted control in Cairo. But it is clear, Napoleon will never win the hearts and minds of the Egyptians. Nope. For all of his desire to try and embrace their culture, he really was never viewed as more than, a, like they said, as an outside invader trying to conquer them, trying to take over from other outside invaders as they were viewed. The next few months see the French languish in Cairo. There is limited communication with France, much homesickness, and a dwindling supply of stores, ammunition, and wine. Mm. There is also an outbreak of bubonic plague, which torments the army and further thins its ranks. And this is one of those moments, though, where Napoleon again shows why he's beloved by his men. There's this dramatic scene where he actually picks up one of the guys who's dealing, I think, with the plague and carries him to the hospital uh, to show that he has no fear. And, and, you know, it could have been a really risky and dangerous thing to do. The only action is in the south, where General Desai's column, 2,800 men, pursue Murad Bey deep into Upper Egypt. In this epic chase, one officer distinguishes himself. A 28-year-old cavalry brigadier named Louis-Nicolas Davout. Hello. On the 22nd of January, 1799, he and Desai inflict a serious defeat on Murad Bey, scattering his remaining forces. Murad himself escapes and remains at large. But such military victories do little to change the outlook for Napoleon's expedition. Some of you may, may wonder why, if they're going south, is that called Upper Egypt and why is Lower Egypt in the north? You'll see this on a lot of maps. It has to do with the flow of the river. The river, the Nile River flows from south to north and empties into the Mediterranean up here north of Cairo. So the upper part of the river is down that direction to the south. Uh, in Ohio, we have Upper Sandusky, which is south of Sandusky because the, the river flows toward the north. Same thing. They remain 1,600 miles from France with no prospect of reinforcements or getting home. Napoleon briefly puts his hopes on a diplomatic solution. France's foreign minister, the brilliant, urbane and Talleyrand. slippery Charles Maurice oh, de yep. Talleyrand had been an early supporter of the Egyptian expedition. He's assured Napoleon that he will personally travel to Constantinople to smooth relations with the Sultan and win Egypt for France. It's gutsy. But Talleyrand never leaves Paris. The Sultan remains furious at France's attack on his Egyptian province. There is to be no negotiation and no compromise. Orders have gone out to every corner of the Ottoman Empire 
to raise troops to drive out the French invader. Napoleon's position looks more desperate than it's ever been. His troops cut off, disease-ridden, in the midst of a hostile population. He will respond in the way that seems obvious to him, as it would to his hero Alexander. He will attack. Go on the attack. This is, this is a, a pretty common thought process, even for the next hundred years after this. Even in the early part of World War I, they'll have what's called the cult of the offensive, which is that it's always better to attack. But in Napoleon's case, it's really simple. You keep the initiative. You go after them before they can consolidate their forces and trap you in a situation where you're besieged and you have no escape to the sea because you don't have a navy anymore to, to help you get out of there. Uh, so you go on the attack and you catch them before they can consolidate. You keep the initiative. You keep them guessing as to what your next move is. All right, well, they obviously have set that up to where we're going to have future episodes where we're going to see what happens next uh, with Napoleon in Egypt. So be definitely keep a close eye out for those. I, I know a lot of you, when a new episode of something like this comes out, immediately start telling me about it, and I appreciate that, and I'm not discouraging you from doing that. But my standard practice is to give a little bit of time for the original content to marinate, so to speak. Let everybody watch that who wants to watch it before I do my reaction. So I'm not really stepping on the original content creator too much in that way. So when future episodes come out, we will visit them uh, a little while after they come out. Uh, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to Charles in Columbus, Ohio, and Joel in Gold River, California. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. If you want to support the channel through Patreon, the link is in the description. Uh, to be able to go and do that, as well as to the other channels, like I mentioned. New content went up today on VTH Extra. I ranked all of the popular U.S. fast food chains on a tier maker. Let me know what I got right and what I got wrong. Thanks for watching.